And you're here live with us here on C Major Before the Show on a Saturday night. We have something to say about flat chords tonight. Thank you so much for tuning in. We're glad you're here. And we just invite you to just stay with us tonight because we have a lot to say about flat chords. We are here continuing our Piano for Parents series. It's continuing. It's going to be about a year that we'll just keep talking about chords and re-talking about chords and talking some more until we really, really get to a point where we think that we should move on to something else, but we're devoting 2019 to the study of chords. So thank you so much for being here with us. And if you know of any parents that need to tune in to learn more about chords, feel free to invite them to the podcast. If you are not a parent and you want to tune in, you can do that too. So we'll say a little bit more about that coming up a little bit later here in tonight's broadcast. C Major Porter. It's so nice to be with you on this Saturday night. The weather is trying to warm up just a bit. We really went through some brutal cold temperatures. If you're living here in the greater New York City area, you know exactly what I'm talking about. And not that it was below zero or anything like that. It was just days of snow and ice and cold and just left us all wondering, is spring going to show up like Puxatawney Phil promised us? <laughs> he promised that we would have an early spring, and here we are. But it did warm up a little bit today, so we're happy about that. Aren't you happy? Yes, and thank you for your enthusiasm about the weather. But I did want to say that yesterday, if you heard our promo, we did mention International Women's Day, which was an important day. And I wanted to use part of today's podcast episode to mention some of the women that I've read about in history that inspire me and continue to inspire others to find your own voice in your music making. One way to do that is through chords. Another way to do that is just through your own way of becoming musically literate over time. And there's nothing but time. Just just spend the time that you have becoming more and more informed about how music is made. So whether you're doing that through technology whether you're doing that through the old-fashioned way of learning music theory and what all of those terms mean, just just do it. Find a way to do it. You owe it to yourself to to just jump in and, and make the best music that you can make. So we're going to talk tonight about flat chords. And I have some shout outs to start off with at the top of today's episode. I just want to give another shout out to our guest from last week, Miss Jessica Gibson, who is now famous. Thank you so much again for for coming on the podcast, and I really appreciate it. And I do have another important interview coming up that I would like to feature, and I'll say a little bit more about that as it as we come closer to it. But I'm very excited about this individual. She is a leader. When it comes to music making, a leader in the community, and she really believes in music education for adults, for anyone, really, all ages. But she has something to say in particular about music making for adults, and I really want to hear what she has to say about that. So just stay tuned because I will be talking with her and I will mention as we get closer 
the shape of that conversation and what to expect. So I hope you'll tune in for that. And I have shout outs, of course, to all of my students. But something that's new this week, I have some testimonials. And it's really just acknowledging that over the years, my students write to me. They write notes. Sometimes they say, thank you for teaching me. But this one particular note really touched my heart. And I'm going to paraphrase it, of course, and post it on my social media. So look out for that. But this student was really, really inspired by the things that we talk about in in music class. And he went as far as asking his parents if he could write a letter to me and on the front of the the letter is like a little card that he made out of it as well and he colored it it says I love you Miss Porter and on the inside he's saying I hope you have a wonderful day and, and I look forward to seeing you in the next lesson and you are the best music teacher I ever had and I just want to say to that student that you are the best you are the best because you give your best every week. So shout out to that student. And I love you too. So I'm going to post a little bit of this over in my social media a little bit later on. Like I said, probably over at my Music Glue page. And then this is another card. It just says, you know, it's from parents. And it just says, you know, thank you so much for keeping our son interested in improving. And we just thank you for another year of piano lessons. So I just want to say I really appreciate that family and the note that they gave to me. So. I appreciate you. I appreciate the support of the parents who week after week after week they they just wait to see what's going to happen. I have parents that have no expectations when it comes to music in their families, but they know that they want some some form of fashion of music making to take to take place. So oh, it's just um it's inspiring to me to to see that. So I have another note here, another testimonial. And it just says, thank you for being so patient and helping me pass piano with my highest grade yet. I am so lucky to have you as a teacher. So shout out to that student. If you're listening, you know what you wrote. And I'm inspired by my students when they tell me stories like this. So these three testimonials in particular I'm going to post on my page just so you can see some of the correspondence that I get. And I've gotten correspondence over the years, but those three in particular really hit home. So I just want to talk now about next week's show that hopefully it will include an interview speaking more about adults making music. We really want to keep that theme going here. So if you are a parent, if you are a college student, if you are just someone who maybe lost the opportunity to study music as a child or somehow had an interruption, we invite you to tune in to next week's show because we're going to spend some extra time talking about ways that you can get into music making and what that might mean for you here in 2019. So is this something that will impact your health, your wellness, if you just jump right in and and start to make music all over again? Earlier I did tweet about this and I just offered a quote that said that adults really know the value of practicing 
because they know how they want to spend their time and they know what it's going to mean if they just put the time in to practice as opposed to some of the younger students who are just who are just finding that out for themselves and I do have another shout out to another student who is just learning what it means to play by ear and by chords so shout out to that student because he exclaimed this week how do you know what's coming next how can you just figure out a song by ear like that and I said well it takes time but it can be done and what I really wanted to tell him was that a lot of it has to do with the method that you're in that you you have to be really comfortable with exploring all that music has to offer when it comes to ear training and as I'm saying that it's just reminding me that I wanted to pull something down to share with you so I'm walking now so I can pull that down but if you've been listening to the podcast you know that from time to time I talk about and I just share with you how I learned to play the piano and I know for a fact if it were not for the information that I received from my piano teacher see if this book is available that I may not have been as comfortable when it came to playing in different keys and certainly playing different chords. I think I have it here. Okay. It's right next to my organist manual. So some of my friends know that from time to time I do play on a cathedral organ or a pipe organ. But I just want to point out this book. It's by Dr. Robert Pace, and it's called Skills and Drills. And this is a book that I actually grew up with. Now, the copyright is really old because when this book was published, we're talking about a little bit past the mid-20th century that this book came out. And then, of course, it was republished and updated. But you no longer see this book the way it was published then on the market, but just imagine if you can just close your eyes and just listen for a moment to some of the things that I had to go through in my training. So right away, at this particular level of the book, I am asked to explore music creatively and learn to play chord progressions in all keys. And then there's a diagram that shows me about first inversions and what 6-4 means and making sure I understand the second inversions and then I had to play the chord progressions in all three positions and then I had to transpose it up by half steps to all keys and then we had something called melodic harmonization so I had to first play the melody in the bass of the song and then harmonize it as suggested and then notice that letter names may be used instead of numbers to identify chords. So it's like he did both. He made sure we understood all these symbols that you may come across. And then we had something called chord study. So the instructions say, after playing these chord progressions as written, transpose them by half steps to all keys. Fill in the missing notes and then identify each chord. And then we had to study intervals. And then we had to study minor key signatures. And then we had a part called improvisation. Improvise four bars to complete this phrase. Then improvise an answering eight-bar phrase using the same rhythmic fragment. Now, considering these two phrases, your A section, improvise a contrasting B section to create a two-part form. So, I don't recall how old I was when I, when I, 
when I studied this book called Skills and Drills, but I just remember feeling really complete, you know, that I had as much information that I needed to go forward. Seventh chords. We talked about seven chords last week. And here is an exercise. Play and listen to the quality of each seventh chord. We talked about that. I had a teacher that would just play the chords and ask us to listen to those. Now, write a seventh chord on each tone of the scales of D and A major. Mark the number and quality of each chord as an example. And then you have a couple of examples here. Now, here's another one. Use A as an example meaning the letter A, the way it's ordered, filling the correct sharps, flats, or naturals for these seventh chords. So we had to do all of this, and then we had to come up with ideas for seventh chord improvisations, experiment with the rhythm and the chords for variety, try it in several keys. I could go on and on and on, and I think what I'll do is just share a little bit more of this a little bit later on the C Major Radio Show, because... Someone listening to that show may be a little bit more interested in knowing all the particulars, all of the details that we had to go through. Now, one thing I didn't have to do, I didn't have to, let's say, if I learned to play uh, a Chopin prelude, like we talked about last week. And by the way, there's two different pronunciations of that. I was listening to New York's classical station. I heard somebody say, prelude. If you prefer to say it that way, then say it that way. But I say prelude. And so I, I don't remember, I don't recall being challenged to transpose a Chopin prelude. I don't recall that, but thinking back on it now, that would have been a nice challenge just to make sure I really understood how the harmony was moving and so forth, especially if you went as far as doing the whole analysis. But there's just so much to talk about tonight. We're talking about half steps, we're talking about intervals, what does that mean, and so I'm going to jump in in a few moments, and I'll be right back to talk to you more about flat chords, but first we'll talk about half steps and intervals, so back in a moment. with C major and you're here on C major before the show so we're just going to move on now to our discussion about half steps if you happen to call those semitones and you can use that language too but I'm just going to say half steps tonight so we are trying to have you play flat chords tonight so go ahead and get out your chord chart the one with the red dots and if you want to know a little bit more about the resources that we use here on C Major Before the Show in the Piano for Parents series, please see our syllabus over at musicglue.com. But I like this chart because it really does outline everything clearly with red dots. And it might make it a little bit easier for you 
to visualize how the half steps work. So I would just say, look at, for instance, look at a D chord. Let's look at look at let's look at D first. So if you see the first red dot for D, you'll see D is in the middle. So one, two, D is in the middle. So you see your group of two black keys, and the D is the one white key in the middle. So we're talking about black and white key relationship, not so much in terms of sharps and flats yet, and and flats in particular for tonight's episode. But then go to the next key. So one, two, three is that third black key on the end. So if you're going north, east, south, west, is that west black key. And then you go to one, two, three, and then you see the white key that you need to play D. So if you're thinking about your spacing on the white keys, first of all, if you found D as the one white key in the middle, excuse me, and then did your spacing on the white keys, note, space, note, space, note, you would just take that middle key up to the black key, and that's your D chord. Now, to play D flat, basically you just move everything a half step lower. So by half step, we mean to the very next key to the left. So now your D becomes a black key, if you want to see it that way. Just move it one half step to the left, to the very next key to the left. Now that black key that was in the middle becomes a white key, because because now you're stepping down. And then the top key, which is a white key for a D chord, now becomes a black key. So I hope you can picture this and see how it's moving. So I want you to do that for D, and then I want you to do that for E, and then I want you to do that for A. Okay? So if you're going in that order, just try to play a D, and then go to a D flat. Try to play an E, and then go to an E flat. And then try to play an A, and then go to an A flat. So I just want to give you a moment to do that. Before we go into the other chords that I want to talk about tonight, I'm just going to go over this little section that's talking about sharps, flats, and natural. So if you happen to have the music theory book that we talked about earlier in our course, just know that to find black notes on a keyboard, just know that on a keyboard, black notes take their name from the white notes. So a black note to the right of a white note has the same letter, but with a sharp added. So we're talking about flats. So there's also another way of naming the black notes. A black note to the left of a white note has the same note, has the same name as the white note, but with flat added. So the music sign for flat is like a little b. So it's not quite... The same as the letter B, it's 
it's close. But if you find D, like we just said, then the black note to the left of D is therefore a D flat. The black note to the left of E is E flat and so on. And then we went over to A flat. So now I just want to say that I challenge you to find G flat. Now G flat is my favorite chord. So you may have seen the picture of the G flat that we posted on our promo and because it just made me think about the G flat A2 that Chopin wrote that one of my friends was so brilliant at playing and then of course we have to talk about B flat and then we talk about we can go ahead and talk about B tonight as well but I'm more interested in in B flat so really the main chords I want to have you find for homework and I'll post this over at C majors classroom a little bit later would be D flat, E flat, A flat, G flat, and then B flat. But go ahead and find B. So basically, although every black note can have two names, usually only one of them would be correct. And so we can we could talk about that further. But it's so funny to me sometimes you hear musicians that haven't really quite studied sharps, flats, and naturals formally that you just they just call it whatever they want. So they refer to enharmonics, if you will, within a chord. So they might spell, for instance, a G flat chord as F sharp, B flat, D flat. And not realizing they really should spell a G flat chord as G flat, B flat, and D flat. So they're really calling it what what they can. Or they may say F sharp, A sharp, D flat. So we don't really do that. We don't really mix sharps and flats in key signatures. And some publications will go as far as to say you never mix flats and sharps and key signatures. And I almost said that too in tonight's description, but then I thought about this one time when I play I play from a score where the composer had written in one key signature for the right hand and then another key signature for the left hand. But the publication is right. You don't, I didn't see a mix. I didn't see where he had me playing a B flat and then a D sharp. I didn't see that. But it wouldn't surprise me if you have some composers that just want to show what's possible for composition, breaking all of the rules and saying never say never, and then they just do what they want. And then it's left up to whomever's reading the score to be able to read all of that. So someone might say, well, why shouldn't we mix flats and naturals in a key signature if you can have accidentals? where the score is mixed with sharps and flats, why can't we do the same thing for a key signature? So I'm sure somebody out there has done it, but the closest I think I've come to seeing that is where I was playing in D, for instance, with the left hand, and then my right hand was playing in G flat. And so I had to read two key signatures at the same time. And I don't recall the name of that score, but it's out there somewhere. Anyway, let's go back to what we were talking about with semitones. So instead of using the word semitones, I'm going to say half steps because we're talking about distance. So if you can understand the distance from one note to another, we use that formal name called the interval. We say it's the interval between them. And really what we mean is how far apart it is. And the smallest interval on a keyboard is the one between any note and the note immediately next to it. And we call this interval a half step. And of course, you know, I have students that are really, really clever. And they're always trying to get me to tell them what do you call the space in between the keys. And they're trying to look in there and see what's in, in between the cracks and things like that. And what's underneath. And 
sometimes they say, oh, I can see the hammers moving and things like that. But we really are just talking about what it takes to play chords on the piano. So the interval between the white note B and the white note C is also described as a half step. And so is the interval between E and F. And we're talking about E natural and F natural. So you, you could probably get more into this type of language if you start to talk about scales, which we will not talk about so much in this in this course. So I will let you know when we're getting a little bit closer to the end of the 12 weeks for the Piano for Parents series and then taking a break and then going into another 12 weeks. So we're basically treating the course like it's a semester and I'm still deciding what I'm going to say from 12 weeks to 12 weeks if I would just repeat the same information and just vary it a little bit and throw in some other information as we go or if I would do something totally new. I'm more leaning towards just repeating the course and then making it fresh, getting a fresh start. So that way, if you want to hear it all over again, but with new dates as they are posted, as we go week to week, then I would just encourage you to be ready to listen all over again as we start with the C chord and we go on from there here in this this series. But thank you so much for tuning in. So hopefully you were able to find the flat chords. And as you notice, I am not playing tonight. I did that on purpose. I didn't want to play anything on the piano tonight. I just really wanted to have you just take a look at a visual and see what you can find for yourself. And just see how comfortable you are. Now what's going to happen is if you are able to find all of the flat chords... It's going to hope it's going to open up a whole new world for you. So now when you pick up that music score or that lead sheet and you see the chords, now you know how to approach playing that. Or if you prefer, you can always transpose it to an easier key. So even though my stage name is C major, I do play in other keys. I'm not just restricted to C major, but C major is a good luck key for me, which is why I call myself C major. So speaking of keys, just so you can know what we mean when we say keys, a piece of music made from the notes of a scale is said to be in the key of that scale. So that's what we mean. And then sharp or flat signs after the clef sign are the key signature of the music. So that's just to throw in a little bit more information for you in case you were wondering. And then I think I mentioned accidentals. Let's just go ahead and cover that really quickly too. So this is all language that you can use to start to build your own your own dictionary of music, if you will. Just put together your own list of, of terms that you don't understand yet or terms that you think you may come across. But individual notes can be raised or lowered a half step by using a sharp, a flat, or a natural sign. So that's what you see when you're seeing the music. And since we're talking about this, then we might as well go ahead and just talk about what does it mean to see a double flat? So for those of you who are going, what? Double flat? Yes, there is something in music called a double flat. So before considering other kinds of scale, something must be said about a problem which has to do more with minor scales, but sometimes it's necessary to add a further sharp to a note or a flat. So a double flat would lower a note by two half steps. And the sign for this is two flats together. So have you seen that? It looks like two little B's, so it's not quite a B. And then since we have mentioned sharp already, I'll just say that a double sharp, you wouldn't see two sharp signs or two number signs, which it looks like two number signs for a sharp, but you would just see an X. It's often written as a small letter X. 
which it closely resembles, and that's the sign for a double sharp. And what it means is to raise a note two half steps. So you can have something called C double sharp, for instance, but it would sound the same as a white note D on the keyboard. So I've never heard anyone describe a chord as a double flat anything, but that's just some of the terminology for you to consider. Okay, so was that helpful to you tonight? I hope so. And again, just remember to take out your piano chords, the plastic chart, and where it says key, major, and then everything is in red dots, and you can just go down the line. So the order that I would give you would be to play a D, and then go to a D flat, play an E, go to an E flat, play an A, go to an A flat, and then from there, go back up to a G, and then go to G flat. So that should be all black keys for that. And on this chart, I will say they do give it to you enharmonically. Enharmonically is spelled E-N-H-A-R-M-O-N-I-C-A-L-L-Y, enharmonically. Not I-N. So you will see a G flat, and then underneath that you'll see an F sharp at the very bottom of this chord chart. So after you've figured out G and then G flat, then go back and pick up, I would say pick up a B flat and then pick up a B. Or if you care to play B first, which is at the top of the page. So if you think about a B chord and you're playing it as a triad, then B has two black keys on top. So B itself is a white key and it's the only chord that has two black keys on top and you can see that. And then you reverse it so that you have a black key with two white keys on top. So that's basically it in a nutshell for black and white key relationship. And then join us over at the C Major Radio Show. A little bit later on tonight, I'm going to post a description of tonight's show where we will talk about black chords as well. But we're going to talk a little bit more in technical terms. So... If the terms we use over here is a little bit too easy for you and you need more music theory terms, then please feel free to join us over there. Okay, so I'm going to take just a small break to get a sip of water, and then I'll be, I'll be right back in a moment.
And thank you so much for tuning in to C Major Before the Show. And what I'm going to do now, I'm going to do a live tweet. I thought about doing this during the week, and I thought, you know what? What would be more interesting than just a radio drop or something like that? I think it would be more interesting to do a live tweet. It's sort of like doing a radio drop, except it's like a social media drop. So let's go there first. Okay, so if you go to C Major Before the Show, which is a public page, then you'll see that I posted something earlier today that I'm working on a t-shirt, and that's true. So... one of my recent posts. Okay, so now let's go back to my page and see what else is there. So you could just see I posted a, a link that said B flat, E flat, and G flat chords, more black notes. How many black notes will you play when it comes to flat chords? So that was what we posted. And then prior to that, we posted something from Poll Everywhere. So if you've had a chance to participate in our poll, what I'm aiming to do is when we do a live show is to have you doing live responses to the poll. So let me just click on that really quickly. And it allows me to split the page. But our latest poll was, what is classical music? And I didn't mean that to be a question that challenges the definition of classical music, but I really want to know what you think it is. And then you have your You have your multiple choice there. So is it music created and recorded since World War II? Is it music that developed from the mid-20th century? Revival of folk music? Is it music composed between 1100 and the present day? Is it a musical form originated in the southern states of North America in the closing years of the 19th century? What do you think it is? And then think about it. You know, what what does classical music mean to you? I've heard friends describe music as classical music and then I listened to it and I thought this is not classical at all so what does classical music mean to you so feel free to 
go to pollf.com and then see us over there and just provide your answers. Now, what I'm aiming to do is in the future have a live audience so that we can just pull you right on the spot using PowerPoint and just have you doing live interaction. So I know that day is coming, and hopefully it's coming soon. I'm going to be working really, really hard between now and the summer months to boost audience participation. Now, if you happen to be on the CMAGE before the show, the homepage on Facebook, then you'll see my efforts to design a collection of CMAGE reporter gifts that you can that you can get for yourself so we're working on a t-shirt design so I'll keep you posted on that and then go to this really really neat website if you if you can so I'm skipping ahead a little bit of my outline but I'm going to go ahead and just mention it now since I'm over here on Facebook but there's something called teoria.com So I actually learned about this through Musica this week. So I'm going to click on that. And it's really interesting because I just did a post on C Major's Classroom of the Chopin Prelude from last week. But this one is a little bit more intense because they do post things in the form of Roman numerals. But there's a lot of really good information on this website. So... If you need a tutorial and you're not looking for an app, I would say go here. So the things you can do for reading music, chords, if you click on that. They have a free curriculum. They're talking about chord construction. They're talking about, you know, the definition of a chord. There are audio examples here. There are exercises that you can get into, references, articles. There's just so much on the internet. It's really hard to know what's on the internet that can help others unless somebody points it out. So you can take part in an exercise for triads. It's loading the sound. It's giving you triad ear training. And everybody has their own way of of introducing this information. This is information that can help you if you're looking for something like that. And then there's a reference page you can go to. There are articles, great questions, titles of articles about music therapy, early sonatas. You're talking about music of Bach. Bach is going to be celebrating another birthday soon. 340 something years, something like that. 1685 to 1750, I believe those are his dates. Okay, but I just wanted to go to that website with you. So now, let's talk more about yesterday, International Women's Day. Oh. <laughs> And there's Jessica Gibson. (laughs) She reacted to my link. (laughs) That was sweet. She is definitely famous. Okay, that's nice. So I'm going to step out of Facebook for a moment. And now I'm going to go to what we were talking about yesterday. We were talking about International Women's Day. So did you have a chance to celebrate that? Hopefully you did. And then March is considered Women's History Month. So I just pulled out some names of women pianists, composers that we might just look up together. So the first one I want to look up, I mentioned my friend, and I call her friend. I met her once, Mrs. Jennings, Pratis Jennings. And I believe she was either reading a book about Philippa Schiller when I met her, or was doing a report on her. So we're just going to look this up. Now if you look this up, it's spelled P 
P-H-I-L-I-P-A as the first name, Philippa, and then Schuller, S-C-H-U-Y-L-E-R. And I believe in New York's classical station did a report where they did a documentary about her as well. I'm just going to click on one. And there's a school name for her as well in Brooklyn. It's a picture of her and then it just says she was a composer and a pianist. You can listen to the audio about her. She achieved national acclaim in the 1930s and 40s as a child prodigy on the piano. But I just recall that she had a certain diet that she had to follow. Which is supposed to help her. And if you read the story, you would say it was very unusual in what they say here. Okay, so this... You know, if you just do a search, you may come across the same website and you'll see see the same photo. And then, see, Natalie Hendaris. I had a friend that was a pianist that always talked about Natalie Hendaris. So she was an American pianist, composer, and professor at Pennsylvania's Temple University. So if you can, look up information about Miss Hinderas, H-I-N-D-E-R-A-S is how you spell the last name. Natalie Leota Henderson, Henderson Hinderas. And they give a little bit about her information. She was born in Oberlin, Ohio, to a musical family, and so forth. And there's some information about where she taught. Okay. All right, now, let's go to a name that may or may not be here, but let's search for it into it. anyway. Armenta Adams. Okay, so it does come up. So if you go to WNYC.org, it gives you the story. And again, I just came across these names in the book that I was reading, but I had not looked them up on the internet yet. Okay, so that was a picture as well. So it just says, Armenta Adams Hummings was founder of the Gateways Music Festival. She grew up a pianist, graduated from the Juilliard School of Music, performed at Avery Fisher Hall and Alice Tully Hall, and was honored at a reception at the State Department for her contributions to international relations through her concert performances around the world. So that's really inspiring to know she was able to do that with her music making. You know, sometimes you don't really know if your music making and how you choose to use it, if it's going to, if it's going to have that type of impact. Okay, now another name that I came across because a while back I wanted to just take a look at some spirituals, and I came across Undine. I believe that's how you say her name, Smith Moore. Let's look that up really quickly. Okay. 
Okay, so I'll just click on the first thing that came up. So they just described her as notable, prolific, also a professor emeritus at Virginia State University. So you can read more about her, and I'll spell the first name, U-N-D-I-N-E. I believe you pronounce it Undine, and she was born in Virginia. You can say more about her history. She began teaching piano, organ, music theory, so... Very inspirational to see that. Okay, and then just one more. Let's look up Julia Perry. Okay. So all of the names that I mentioned just to me are just so inspirational just reading the stories about what they had to endure just to to show they had the talent to play classical music to compose American classical music to do what Julia Perry did combine European classical and neoclassical training and just seeing what she went through to study. So she studied for it. She studied piano. She studied competition. She went to Italy to study and, and so forth. So sometimes you just go through so much. And I just recall when I did a competition that I had a judge that came to me and said, I don't understand how you can play this music. And to this day, I'm not really sure how to take that comment. But Apparently, this person is still around, still teaching and and judging competitions today on a national level. And he's right here in New Jersey, in the greater New York City area. So, what I want to do now is invite you to tune in to next week's show. Again, just to remind you, if you're just tuning into the C Major Radio Show, we've been talking about flat chords tonight. And we also took some time to step onto social media to take a look at some things that you may be interested in. I want to invite you to next week's show, where we continue our discussion about adults and making music. We'll tie in the subject of wellness and music making. And we'll continue our discussion on chords. So what's next for chords? You probably want to know. I think what I will do next week is talk about, I think I'll talk about ninth chords. And I may even talk about Augmented and diminished chords. I haven't really quite decided yet what next week's topic will be, but it will be something new, something fresh for you to put into your into your musical notebook. By the way, are you doing your homework? Did you do your homework? Da da dun da da dun da da dun. I hope you did, and. If you want to know what the homework was, just take a look at C Major's Classroom. Now, we have redesigned the site so that we now call it cmajorporter.com so you can find it a little bit easier. And so see us over there because what I will do is post something about flats. And then I'll post the assignment over there and then I'll say on my social media, it's now posted so you can find it over there and on social media as well. And then I know I mentioned stickers in our description for tonight's show. I just want to say a little bit about that. It's not really a shout out, but I just will say that I'm really just intrigued by my students that are motivated by the cat stickers that I share, for instance. There's a piano cat. There's a double bass cat. And this week I introduced sparkle stickers. And then I found some dog stickers 
for students that are requesting that. And now I have requests for Harry Potter stickers. So that was the reason for mentioning Harry, Harry Potter this week. I wasn't trying to be fresh by saying my students are excited about Harry, Harry Potter that is. But um, it's really meant to be in all. It's really meant to be and fun. <laughs> so I hope you really take it that way. I um, I like to have fun here on on C major before the show. So time change tomorrow. Don't forget to move your clocks ahead and check us out over at musicglue.com slash C major porter. I'm going to post the testimonials over there. And I just encourage you to keep on listening. You are here on C Major Before the Show. Our Piano for Parents series continues, and it will be all year long that we're talking about chords. So I hope you will stay with us. Join us a little bit later tonight. We're going to be over at the C Major Radio Show, and we look forward to having further discussions with you about chords and flat chords and other chords as they come up in our discussion thank you for listening have a great evening have a terrific weekend and i'll see you next time right here on c major before the show